So here we are in DaVinci Resolve, we've got our video already loaded in and we've jumped into the Fusion page. So in order to uh, achieve this effect we have to use a camera tracker. So if we push Shift and Spacebar we can search for the camera tracker and we can add that to our node tree. If we drag that up to our first window and we click this little tick box here this will show us our track locations. And we can see we've got a few little yellow dots on our screen showing us which areas of this image are going to be tracked. Now if you know how the camera tracker works already you can skip ahead but if you don't I'll give you a quick overview on what these controls do and how we're going to um, track our scene to add our text and shadow in. First off we have the detection threshold. Now the detection threshold is how much of a contrast there needs to be within the image for a tracking marker to be placed there. So if we drag this down it's going to look for it's going to allow a lower contrast area to have a tracking mark placed against it. Now, higher tracking areas are going to give you a better track, but sometimes you might need to reduce the contrast to get enough tracks onto your scene to get to get a good tracking um, tracking result. Uh, the minimum feature is how far spread out these tracking markers are going to be between each other. So if we drag this up, we'll see that the tracking markers become far spread out so we don't get many tracking markers. If we drag it down we see they become all clumped together and we get a lot more. So in order to try and get a good track on this image I'm going to put the detection threshold up and see if I still get plenty plenty of um, tracking markers because it's got plenty of high contrast within this image that's fine. The uh, minimum tracking markers I'm going to drag down just a little bit just to get a few more on there. Um, you do have an option of bi-directional tracking which will track the track forward and then track the um, the video backwards which will give you a slightly more accurate track and possibly get a few more tracking markers in there. I found it a bit hit and miss, it sometimes crashes the miniature resolve so I don't use it in this situation. If you've got a video you can give it a go, if it crashes just don't use it. So once we've um, decided our tracking details we press auto track, it will scan through the image tracking the markers that we've we've assigned to it and once that's done we can scrub through the image and we can see that these tracking markers move with our video so once we've done that it's on to the next tab which is our camera tab now ideally when you're doing camera tracking you should know the focal length and the aperture size so you can put these details in this is just a stock footage so we don't know those details it looks like it's been took from some kind of drone which I have no clue which one it is but if we set this around about 20 I found that to be quite acceptable for 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 drone images where you don't know the actual focal length but if you know these details you really should be putting them in it's going to give you a much better track so then onto the next tab which is the solve tab and um, if we look down at the bottom here we can see we've got 11,136 tracks. That's a lot of tracks, it's going to take a long time to solve. Depending on the length of your footage you don't really want to be going above 6,000 and somewhere between 2 to 4 is, is generally going to give you uh, a nice, nice effective track anyway. So to reduce these tracks down we have um, some track filtering options here. So the top one is the minimum track length. This is how many frames a track has to stay um, consecutive. Stay on this. I can't get my words out. This is how many how many frames a single track has to stay on the uh, uh, on the track. So if we move this up to say ten, any one of these tracking markers that doesn't last for ten frames will be deleted. Or well, not deleted. It'll be selected. So that means we've got 7,000 tracks selected. Um, if we delete those, that leaves us with 3,000. So we can drag our min maximum track area down a little bit, see if we can select a few more. So if we go to about 8,000, and then we deleted those tracks by pressing this delete button here, that'll remove all tracks that are less than 10 frames and have a track error above 0.127. After we've done that, we've got down to 3,000 tracks. We can hit our solve, and we get an error saying that we don't have enough frame, enough um, tracks between two frames. Um, you have to have a minimum of eight tracks that 
overlap. So if you get this error, just click OK, undo, and um, adjust your track selection. So we'll bring down the amount of tracks that can be, um, the amount of frames a track can have. So if we, if we reduce that down to seven, and then we just reduce the track error, so we get roughly around about the same amount of tracks, and try solving in this situation. We've still got the problem, so we're clearly re removing tracks that we are we need to complete. Back to my uh, auto track, and I'm just going to reduce the contrast levels because this might be causing some problems if this detection threshold is too high. And we'll run our auto track again. Go back to our solve tab and just see if we can get back down to a couple of thousand and it's allowing us to solve. There we go. So if you get that problem, it might be that your detection threshold's too high and you're not getting enough um, enough uh, uh, tracks that are crossing over enough mm -hmm. frames. So you can always go back, adjust your detection threshold and the amount of tracks that you get on there and then go back and, and try solve again. So once our track has been solved, you get a little summary here, and we need to pay attention to this average solve error. If this is not below 0.5, then you're unlikely to get a good track in which you can place objects in your scene and then look seamless. They're going to maybe vibrate about a little bit or, or jump out. They're just not going to stay perfectly still. So getting this below 0.15 is, is quite important to get a good final result. If yours is above 0.15, this is the point where you can start trying to use your minimum solve error. So if you drag this down, and you'll see eventually tracks will start getting selected. So I'll just show you a quick example. So if I set it to anything below, say 0.16, that's going to select 149, 179 tracks. I can delete those tracks, and I can run my solve again, and we'll see if it improves this 0.1485 for us. Now the 0.1485 it doesn't need improving, it's a very, very good track, it's going to give us a very good final result. But just as an example, um, if you are in problems at all, you can improve it just by um, reducing the minimum solve error of your tracks. So as you can see, this has made our solve error even better. Now this is incredibly good, you'll, you, not very often you'll get a solve error this low. But it's nice seeing for it, there's plenty of contrast areas, so we've got a nice healthy track. So once we've uh, completed our track, we need to jump into our export options. And if you expand this 3D scene transform, you'll see here it says aligned. Now, what we need to do is we need to change this to unaligned, and this is going to allow us to set our ground plane up, which will become important later, and our origin point. So the origin point is anything that we input into this 3D scene, the origin point is where it's going to be defaultly placed for us to move it about. So I want my text to appear somewhere in the middle of this field. So if I select find out which trackers are um, available, they'll highlight when they're um, available. So if I select those two there and we'll use that as my origin point for importing my 3D text. I click set from selection and that aligns the uh, origin point with these two. Next is the ground plane um, because the casting shadow is going to be up on this hillside and we're going to use the ground plane to um, simulate the ground. We need the ground plane to align with this part of our image. So we just do a box select and select as many of those planes as I, uh, those trackers I can. And I click set from selection for the ground plane. It's going to align the ground plane amongst these um, these tracking markers here. So once we've done that, we change that to aligned and then we hit our export button. And this is going to kick out uh, five different nodes. The, um, we have the, the camera, which is the actual camera rotation. This is going to um, simulate the same camera movement in a 3D space. Go merge to merge all our items together. Go point cloud, which is all the little tracking markers in 3D space. And we've got our ground plane, which is the um, now in wireframe, we'll turn that off. You can see there's a plane, and that should be aligned with our ground tracking markers. Which, if we look there, we can see it looks pretty well aligned. Um, and we'll grab our output render. 
So if we drag our Merch 3D into our first one, our first window, it gives us um, all these detail, all these items in a, in a 3D environment. <coughs> so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the point cloud and I'm just going to reduce the size of these points because they're very big and messy so it makes them a lot clearer if we just reduce them down and easier to work with. So if we put our camera render into the uh, second window we can see what we're getting now. For the time being we don't need the ground plane so we're just going to disconnect the ground plane and we're going to move that to the side. And for organization's sake I'm just going to take the camera tracker out by pressing shift select and moving it away. And I'm also going to disconnect the media out for now. So all we've got at the moment is our media in is running into our 3D scene which is as we can see projected at the back of all our nodes. So now it's a case of adding in our 3D text so we need our 3D text node, we'll drag that down here we're just going to make it simple and the 3D text is going to be shadows so if I drag that into the 3D scene we'll see now it appears where we set that origin point. Now I want this text aligned with these um, these tractor marks that are running along the grass. So I'm going to uh, select my 3D text. I could go into the transform and play around with the rotations in here until I go it somewhere I like, but I actually prefer myself doing it in the um, 3D window. So I'm just going to move this text along. And I'm going to just reduce the size a little bit. <coughs> Uh, we'll add a bit of an extrusion. Maybe a little bit of bell. Let's give it a 3D image. Right, uh, so that's our text in our scene. If we went back to our first scene and um, we turn up high quality to speed it up, press play, we can see that our text is tracked to our, to our video and it looks like it's sitting on the floor. So that's our first part. Now the next part is we need to add in some lighting and do some shadows. So I'm going to disconnect my media in from my camera. I'm going to put it straight to the media out. And then I'm going to use the camera renderer and I'm going to merge it on top of the media in. And just organize this a little bit nicer. So now if we look at the media out, we get the same image we had before. Uh, but this is actually going to be the final image. So I'll just move these around a little bit just to tidy things up. Right, so we're going to add in some lights. And um, first things first, I'm just going to select my camera renderer and we're going to enable lighting and shadows. And you can see that makes it completely black because we don't have any lighting in our scene at the moment. So if I select the Merge 3D, and I'm going to add in a directional light and I'm going to call this, rename this and call it key light just so I, I know where it is and I'm going to move this backwards and upwards now it doesn't actually matter where a directional light is in your scene it will just cast light from that direction um, all across the scene it's just I like to move it so that it makes it just makes sense in 3D space to me. So we want this light to be casting on the back of our shadows because the uh, we can see that the light's coming from this direction by looking at the shadows on the on the image. So we want the light to be represented in the same way. So if I spin this round, uh, we can see these light beams are showing that it's pointing. So it's going to be hitting the back of the shadows text pretty much face on. I'm then going to uh, add another directional light. And this one I'm going to actually call backlight. Now it's a bit confusing because while it is a backlight, it's actually going to be on the front of our shadow. So I'm just going to move it to the front. And I'm going to rotate it so that the light is hitting the front. Now this, um, this is set to a full intensity, so it's just basically 100% light hitting the front of the shadows. I'm going to drag it down so it's not as bright 
and I want this to represent some some light splashback that's coming from from our uh, green grass in front so I'm also just going to actually add a green tinge to this light just so um, the white text is getting a looks like it's getting a, a bit of a green uh, overspill or splashback light onto the front of it and if we zoom in actually we can see also that there's no light hitting these parts so they're just coming in as black we can fix that by adding in a ambient light now an ambient light just lights every surface, surface evenly it doesn't have a direction it's just um, it's just a light added to the scene so the intensity is generally pretty low but you can play about with it just so you get to the point where where the um, the darkest parts are not just pure black they've got a little bit of light on them so then we can see there that bevel on the back has got um, quite a lot of light coming in from our key light and the front has just got a little bit of green splash light um, <coughs> Uh, on this on this section so that's our text set up in the scene we now need to um, create a separate free uh, merge node mm -hmm. in which we can do all our, our shadow rendering so I'm going to rename this merge node here to text merge so I know that that's the text and I'm going to just copy this 3D merge over here. I'm going to plug the ground plane into this one. Uh, we also need to copy a few of these. We need to copy the camera and place this into our merge so that the, uh, the camera tracks the same way as it does with the text. And we want to copy the text but we're going to paste the text as an instance so if um, if we make any changes to either of these it will affect both and not just one so we don't we wouldn't want to be adjusting the size of this text and then the, the size of the shadow not altering so by copying instance this gives us duplicate control we could just drag the output over into these but I just find that it gets very messy with your um, with your node tree if you're, if you're overlapping everything like that so we'll bring our text into our merge 3d and then for our merge 3d we'll select a render 3D to render it out and merge that on top of our um, meter in and because we've got a ground plane in this one we can see that it's just put a nasty big purple ground plane in our scene so um, if we're going to our ground plane and we change its texture to white we can then go back into our merge and we can change our apply mode to multiply and then anything that's plain white will simply not be rendered into that image and it's going to be important for when it comes to casting shadows so it is important from your media in to your media out that your shadow merge and I'll just rename this to shadow merge is before your text rendering merge reason being now it's not so important on this one because the shadows are going to be coming off from the front but if you had these the other way around and the shadows were going backwards they would appear on top of the text rather than the text on top of the shadows so with that being said let's uh, get on to rendering our shadows so if we view this 3d um, <coughs> this merge 3d in our 3d window we can see we've got our shadows there now all we're going to do in this one is we don't need the key light and the backlight, we're just trying to um, render shadows. So we're going to select Spotlight. I'm going to pause Spotlight within this uh, Merge 3D. And this Spotlight needs to be from the same direction as the sun so that we cast the shadows in the same direction. So the easiest way I've found to do this is if we go into the Spotlight and we use Target, this puts a little target on our seam and we can align that somewhere with our text and then what that means is whenever we move our uh, spotlight it will always point towards this target so we want our spotlight to be moved oops sorry, I select the wrong thing it's hard to select sometimes our spotlight wants to be moved 
backwards and up as though it's coming from the sky. And with our 3D window, we need to right click, 3D options and choose lighting and then 3D options and choose shadows so we can see where our shadows will be cast. So because this is uh, simulating a sun, we don't want our shadows to be um, That's just right. I don't want our shadows to be bulging out or, or look like the, the the shadows are coming from a close light source because this just does not resemble the sun. The shadows are going to be pretty much uniform all the way across so to do this we need to move our spotlight quite far back and then that will give us the appearance as though the shadows are coming from the sun and not from just some little spotlight from back and the shadows spreading out. Now because we move the spotlight back we can see that the um, the rendered shadow is really blocky and quite poor so if we go into our spotlight node and we go to um, shadows we've got shadow map size and we can drag that up until we get a, a much better quality uh, shadow representation so we'll notice at the moment it's not actually showing in our final scene and that's because within our render node we don't have lighting and shadows enabled. But when I do enable them we get this horrible black mark um, from the ground plane that's also affecting everything not just the shadows. So if we go into our ground plane and we in the material tab uncheck lighting this turns it totally white and it's not affected by lighting so when it comes through the merge and it gets multiplied anything that's pure white is just uh, multiplied out one thing I forgot to mention earlier is we want to put a override node between our text and our merge. And the reason we want to do this is because we don't want the text rendering through this, we just want the shadow. So if I show the, um, the shadow merge on uh, our, uh, our second display, we see that we've actually got the text in there and we don't want that, we're just focusing on rendering out the um, the shadow in this so if we select our text and search for override 3d and then in the override 3d we select do unseen by cameras and then tick unseen by camera that will take it out of the render and the only thing that will be rendered there is the shadow and we're left with just the darker areas so now we've got the um, the shadow casting on our, uh, on our scene in our final image we could leave it at that it doesn't look too bad but if we notice there's no softness to the edge of these shadows, they're very hard and they're actually a different colour to the shadows that have been cast in the background so they don't look as seamless as they should. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to spotlight, spotlight and down at the bottom here within the shadows tab we have softness. If we change that to constant and we play about with this value uh, eventually should see it update and the softness of the shadow should change. Now that's far too soft so I'll bring the softness down and just so the point where the softness starts to match the, uh, the same as the trees in the background. That looks about right. And The next thing is that this colour is nowhere near a match. These are much darker. These seem to be more, more like an aqua colour to them. Now, in the spotlight we have shadow colour, and if you try to change that aqua, nothing will happen. I seriously don't know why, if anybody does, I can inform me as to why, why this shadow colour doesn't affect the shadow colour. I would be appreciative, and I'm sure everyone else that was um, watching this video would appreciate that as well. So, the other option that we have is, after our render, if we put in a colour corrector, and we can use the colour character to drag the colour closer to what the, the background is and we play around with this until we get something that matches similar to um, those background colours. Now I'm quite happy with that because while the background shadows do look kind of bluish the front ground look much darker so somewhere in between I'm quite happy with that. And then if we um, uh, if you think the shadows are too long or too short you can just play around with your spotlight and just uh, raise the spotlight up or down and that will adjust the length of these shadows. 
Now, if it was a really long shadow and if it was coming over these trees, it's uh, a case of having to mask mask these trees out, otherwise you're going to get shadow cast on trees where it wouldn't be cast. So you just you have to throw a mask around that, that bush there just to eliminate those shadows. But our shadows aren't going to be cast that fine anyway. Just adjust them so they're around about the, uh, the same cast length as the trees behind them. And then if we go into our 3D text and we want to change this to say, yeah, then we can see that our shadow changes with it because we've got the instance between our text and our shadow rendering. And if you want, we can just clean this up a little bit, just group these. So we've got a group and that's our shadow render. Rename text render, and there we have it. So, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial, guys. If you found it useful, please drop a like and subscribe to the channel as it really helps me out. And I will, um, I'll keep these coming. So, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.